thank you everyone for coming and welcome to uh, Real Progressive's fifth monthly national outreach call. I'm Andy Kennedy. I'm a video editor and sound engineer and producer of our weekly podcast, Macro and Cheese, which I hope you're all supporting by downloading, liking, and commenting every week. If you already listened to it, thank you for supporting us. And if you haven't, it is professionally edited, very entertaining, and a great way to supplement your knowledge, not only of the MMT basics, but the way an MMT lens can affect change in all aspects of our society for the better. Tonight, we are fortunate to have two guest speakers, Lua Yule and Matthew Forstater. After editing both of their podcasts, it is not at all surprising to me that they are both teachers. <laughs> there are two types of teachers, people who go to school to become teachers and teachers who become teachers because they should. And I believe that our two guests are in the latter. After a number of wonderful conversations with Matthew, I am thrilled to consider him a friend. I have not personally been introduced or spoken to Lua, but if Matt holds her in the highest regard, then I do as well. When planning for this call, we were originally going to uh, talk about Black History Month, but as we all know, American history is Black history. So every month should really be Black History Month. As progressives, I think we can all agree that American history should be the history of all American people. One thing is for certain, we don't talk about race and racism enough. In Lua's Macro and Cheese interview, she said that we don't have revolutionary change until white people are ready to put everything on the line. I sincerely hope she and Matt talk about that tonight. After Lua and Matt speak, we'll open the floor up to questions. Now, the way this works is we're not going to have any questions until after they are done presenting. But if you have a question or you think of a question and you would like to ask one, please indicate in the chat on the Zoom call that you have a question and we'll write your name down. Or if you don't want to ask it yourself, you can always type the question in and we can ask it for you. That will happen as soon as they're done their presentation. And then to end the evening, Real Progressives founder Steve Grumbine will talk for a few moments and about what's going on at Real Progressives and how you can get involved. And now, to introduce our guests, I'll turn it over to my very good friend, Stephen Grumbine. Is he here? Uh, his name's there. He, uh, uh, he's muted. Rosie, can you unmute Steve, please? I'm here. I, I thought <clears throat> I thought there that I go. was talking through my regular phone line, but apparently not. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, and also, please do forgive us for uh, timing this right in the middle of the Democratic debate. I know that's tough, so you guys are real warriors for making it here. I appreciate it immensely. And Matt and Lua, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Um, really, really enjoyed the interview I did with each of you. And, uh, I, you know, I've known Matt for some time now, and he's one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Just a real genuine, uh, just a great guy. And, and Lua, when we were doing the interview, I think out of all the interviews that I've done, <clears throat> I, it, I had the most mind-blowing moments throughout it just just hearing the understanding of this kind of a 
various uh, phases of wokeness, so to speak. People go through their process of trying to make sense of the world around them. And I, I think that I learned more from that interview than probably just about any of the other ones that I've done, and that's saying quite a bit. Um, we've we've interviewed hundreds of people over the years, so uh, just a tremendously brilliant person. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us tonight, and uh, I will let you guys uh, listen to the wonderful uh, insights of both, uh, both uh, Professor uh, Forstater and Yule. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks so much, Steve, Grumbine, and the whole Real Progressives crew. Uh, I think I can uh, really say that we greatly appreciate the opportunities that you provide for us. And <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to uh, start things off by saying good evening uh, to my colleague and, and very good friend, Professor Lua Yule. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Great, great. And it's uh, great to be doing this with you. We also did a keynote panel at the third Modern Money Theory conference in Stony Brook last autumn. And I think many, many uh, people in attendance or watched uh, the video online really, really enjoyed that. And I know uh, I always enjoy hearing your insights. So you are a law professor, Professor Yule at uh, University of Kansas. But, sitting in my office right now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, but you also are pursuing an interdisciplinary doctorate uh, in economics and education yes. at UMKC. You're also part of a group that is uh, pushing forward a project to create an alternative law and economics from that of the Chicago School variety, which is based on neoclassical economics. So my first question is, what is the value of an interdisciplinary approach to understanding complex real world problems? So this is, a, this is like a major cliche. Uh, so uh, I apologize and forgive me, right? But we've all heard it. We might not know what it's called, the law of the instrument, right? The golden hammer. Um, and what does the golden hammer rule, I guess, say? It says, if the only thing you have is a hammer, every single thing looks like a nail. Um, and in my own, practice of law, I guess, uh, it became really clear to me um, that lawyers look at the world um, and they see legal problems in a particular way and we're trained and educated to be litigious. So we think like going to court uh, fixes the world, rewriting legislation fixes the world. Um, and that felt really limiting in terms of what I wanted to do. I hadn't been like that person who went through uh, schooling wanting to, wanting to be a lawyer, I had lots of interest in lots of ways, and it, it felt very siloed um, how my knowledge was developed. Um, and it, I, again, it's not, this is not a critique, right? If, if we're taught and we're trained in certain ways, we want to use that training. Um, but I also, I wound up, I'm not a degree collector, but I have a lot of different degrees um, and I'm getting more. Uh, but I wound up sort of in my legal space, wanting to draw um, on these other things because I, I recognize that not everything, right? I might only have a hammer today, but not everything is a nail. And so I want to expand 
my toolbox mm. so I can look at problems holistically. And I think, you know, any version, right? If you're just like multidisciplinary, right? So you dabble in a lot of things and a lot of my actual written work, um, I don't say this because the legal academy doesn't like it, I, it, but the methodology that it uses is called bricolage. And bricolage is borrowed from like a French art term where you make art, you create art with just like the objects that are found. You don't, right? Like it's not like I have to do an oil painting or I have to do a sketch in pencil. It's, ah, uh, this is what I want to express. And whatever is gonna allow me to express the idea and understand the issue um, is what I'm gonna use. And so that's, mm. that's how I've approached my scholarship. Um, but we live in a world with real requirements. Um, and so being an autodidact doesn't get you as far as you wanna get. Um, but also learning all of this stuff on your own um, will leave you with gaps. Um, in your foundational education. So pursuing this, you know, interdisciplinary degree allows me to actually get the full training in the things that I'm really, and that I'm seeing really influence the stuff that I want to do. And I think that that's, doesn't have to be at that like high educational level, right? If you are turned on and you're really interested in economics, uh, great. And you can learn and you can find resources, but don't think that the economic question exists in a silo. It's a part of an integrated whole and having multiple tools and multiple lenses is gonna allow you to really engage that in a meaningful way. Mm, right. Uh, and just a follow up. Uh, so the way that the interdisciplinary PhD program works, you have a coordinating discipline and a co-discipline. Your coordinating discipline is in economics. Your co-discipline is in education. I was wondering if you could just say a few words about why you chose education as your co-discipline. Uh, so don't get mad at me. Uh, actually, <laughs> um, education is sort of in terms of my particular interest in developing formalized expertise. Um, education is actually the leader um, and a lot of the impetus of my wanting to, to, you know, not just even do sort of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, but really transdisciplinary work, right? Mm -hmm. I want to get to a point where we're at an at outside of the traditional bounds of a discipline um, and education led that. So um, it was very nice to say uh, that I uh, am in the category of people who are, you know, called to teaching. Um, I'm, I'm going to undermine the compliment because I come from a family of educators. Every single person, um, you know, in my family uh, is an educator professionally <laughs> or otherwise. Um, so I, I actually uh, taught my first class um, ever when I was a very young fourth grader. Um, ah. I ran my own program by sixth grade. Um, I wrote my own curriculum by the time I was in uh, high school. So this is, this is uh, sort of the family business. Um, and I was working, I was in New York uh, in the middle of the uh, financial crisis. And I was thinking about a lot of stuff um, as, a, as a lawyer at a very huge law firm at the center of sort of the legal response uh, to the, the financial crisis. Um, but I also was starting to see just how much um, our education shaped our responses mm. to problems and how we were trained made us see, right? This goes back to, right, if everything you... If, only, if the only thing you have is a hammer, everything is a nail, right? Like how we're trained to see possibilities determines uh, the different options we're gonna pursue. Um, and as I was, you know, sitting in my office, it was a fancier one than this, uh, sitting in my office, uh, slogging through 200 pages of documents, slogging through, um, you know, contracts and disclosure. Um, I started to realize that the law 
was doing a lot of that training. Um, and I really wanted to understand that. And I actually went and I got a master's degree in law that I did. I, it was my, right. I talked about being an, you know, autodidactic and a lot of stuff. I spent my time not taking law classes, um, but actually reading sort of like everything uh, in the theory of education and the theory of curriculum and instruction. Mm. And I was pursuing that project uh, when, you know, really fortuitously through a conversation with some folks, uh, they were like, hey, um, what you're talking about sounds a lot like what these Chicago School Law and Economics folks are doing. Um, and I started reading what they were doing. And then I started reading economics and everything was not satisfactory that I found. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I actually uh, came across the work of uh, UMKC's Fred Lee. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, these are my people. Yes. These are my people. And I thought, you know, I want to explain. So this is just like my own project. I am interested in exploring how through the law, we educate people on the economic possibilities and the economic realities and how the provisioning process must work, right? And so it became this sort of tripod. I've already got the law and the law is doing all this work. The law's method is pedagogical, but the law's content is economic. And so that's sort of how um, I wound up, you know, wanting that training. Again, I had spent all of this time um, doing this theoretical research in education. I had this lifelong experience in education. So as I'm sitting there deciding, what do I need rigorous training on? What do I need to understand methodologically? Um, it was economics and, and it's, it's, it's wound up being way more fruitful than I could have imagined because you know, there were things that I didn't understand and I didn't know were there in the stew, right? And so um, it, it's, been, it's, been, it's been really exciting. Great. Uh, I can't tell you how happy I am that you are at UMKC. It's just uh, it, it really great. So many different directions uh, we could go from <laughs> from here, but one is you mentioned fourth grade, and now it's so long ago that I can sort of look at my eight year old self from a a distance. But uh, one day, I refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance in class, and uh, I. Uh, convinced a, a friend of mine to join me uh, and we were kept after class and the teacher asked why didn't you say the pledge and I immediately responded because there is not liberty and justice for all and I mean I have two sons uh i look at uh, eight-year-old kids i just I, I can't believe that i was able to grasp that but uh, without uh getting into a, a lot uh, longer story but in any case uh why 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 is it assumed that you have to be a woman to stand up against patriarchy and sexism, that you have to be black to have an interest in fighting racism, isn't an injustice to anyone, an injustice for everyone. Well, you know, well, I have a, I have a, I don't, I, I, I know I was teaching. Uh, I can't tell you a lot of stories about when I was in fourth grade. Um, besides the fact 
that I had a secret candy bag <laughs> that I carried everywhere. Um, but I have a third grader. Um, and I guess it's now been two years. So she was a first grader at the time. Um, and uh, you would have gotten along well. Uh, you know my third grader. But you yeah. would have gotten along well if you guys were age contemporaries. Right. Um, because she is, you know, that kind of um, aware kind of kid. Um, and one day, you know, she, we, we were making, we, we, we baked cupcakes. This was a cupcake baking experience. So what I expected was a cupcake conversation. Um, but somehow the conversation came to um, the relationship uh, among black people and white people. She go, we live in Kansas, so there's not a lot of diversity um, in our space. We live in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity in our space. And, and she, she, she said to me, right, she, this is her reasoning process. She says, I wish there were more black people mm -hmm. at my school. And I said, okay, we had this long conversation about economics, frankly, and how that, that was gonna work. And like, right, like there's not a lot of black people where we live and then the you know, socioeconomic position and the social status of the black people here make it less likely that they're gonna be at your Montessori school and blah, 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 so we're going on. And then I said, wait, but why? Why do you want there to be, right? Why do you want there to be uh, more black people at your school? And she was like, well, um, you know, she's counting on her hand, which she can do, the number of black kids. And she's like, basically, you know, to use a, a, adult, you know, terminology and phraseology like when it goes down we don't have enough people to fight on our team mm. against the white people who mm. are going to grow up and they're probably going to be racist and so we really need more people to fight on our team because when stuff happens i need a crew mm. um and you know it's just she's just explaining it to me um and i was like well when i asked the question i like can't some of the white kids who go to your school be on your team. Mm. And she said, you know what? The problem with that is that you don't know which ones are the bad ones and mm. which ones are the good ones. Mm. I don't know who's the racist and who's the not racist. So mm. it's dangerous to have them on my team. Mm. So then she's sitting there and we're like, oh, well, that, that is true. So what should we do? I asked her, what is, so what's going to be your approach? And she stopped herself. And she said, but you know what? I don't know which ones are the bad ones and which ones are the good ones. Mm. Anything could happen. Any of them can be the good ones. So what I need to do, she tells me at, you know, she's in first grade, right? What I need to do is give them a chance and see which ones are the good ones because I'm not gonna get any more black people on my team, we live here. We're not gonna have an, an, an onrush of people who look like me to be on the team. Um, and then she asked me for the cupcake, which is what we were doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> so she says this, right? She says that there's this possibility of danger, but she doesn't know. And what she needs to do is give a chance. Um, and I tell that story, though, if you followed my Twitter feed today, uh, you would see that I was in a little beef, uh, with a guy who suggested that narrative and storytelling is, you know, anti-objective and anti-academic, uh, hmm. which for people to know is both racist and sexist. But anyway, mm. uh, I tell that story because it gets me back to where I talk about sort of like my interest. We have already arrived at a point pedagogically that my first grader understood we are teaching, right? Through our social structures, through our law, through our economic system, we are teaching that there are teams. Right. When we have and, 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 you know, to be the lawyer, right, that I am, you know, think about anti-discrimination law. Mm. Anti-discrimination law demands of us that we create categories, because if you can't prove that some harm was done to you because you're in the category. Right. Mm. Then you weren't discriminated against. Then nothing bad happened. Right. Mm. So it doesn't say it's us against them. Right? The law doesn't say it's us against them, but what the law does is make clear that this is an us against them situation. And so our job is to destabilize that pedagogical moment, right? Our job is to make clear, 
right? And to find ways to resist and push back mm -hmm. against this education that we've received since we were babes, right? Again, I didn't tell a story about me. I told a story about my first grader. And my first grader, like you, is a woke first grader. And so, you know, we need to capitalize. I capitalized on it. It's really great, right? In that moment that you said, wait a minute, there's not liberty and justice for all. But we've got, you know, hundredth graders. <laughs> yeah. We've got uh, adults who need to start to need to start understanding and decolonizing their minds. Right. Absolutely. And I'm going to turn away from you for just a second because my yeah, kids yeah, yeah. arrived. Hey, um, I'll get you. Beautiful. Thank you. Sit down, girls. <laughs> Go ahead. And well, I, I wonder if uh, since uh, we're talking about uh, education from the, you know, very start uh, starts to, you know, colonize our minds. If, uh, if uh, Andy, you could put the slide of the map up. Uh, I was going to mention that we have uh, the standard map of the world, which hung in every classroom. The standard uh, map was called the Mercator map. And uh, it was incredible to me to find out that the Mercator map is completely biased and presents the world in a, a, a way uh, that is not representative of, you know, for example, the equator you would think would be in the center but actually on the Mercator map, they move the equator down. So it's like two thirds of the way down from uh, on the, I, I, I might have to uh, hold it up because uh, yeah, here we go. So, you know, it, it, this is not the Mercator map. This is a map that shows the, um, well, the equator in the middle, it's the Peter's projection map and the relative size of the nations and continents on this map are as they are in reality. And, you know, in the Mercator map, you have the United States and Europe in the center and you do not have Africa and South America and uh, Southern Asia and so on um, as they as they actually uh, are in proportion uh, to one another and you can you can find a, a, a nice tutorial online but I mean it's just an incredible example of the way we we think of maps i suppose as objective and value free and yet this gets ingrained in our mind oh where i'm from is down there and the people who are from Europe, that's it in the center of the world. I, I guess, would you think this is a, a good example of the kind of thing you were talking about of ingrained from the very start? Absolutely, right? And the thing is, you know, for me, that it's so important. I don't study socialization, right? I don't study acculturation which are the ways like, right? Like my kids are, you know, I travel a lot for work. You see my kids in the back, right? Like my kids have been socialized to know how to manage hotels because we stay in hotels. My kids have been socialized to know air travel, 
right? That is stuff that comes from training. I'm a member of a particular religious community, right? My kids have been socialized to know what to do at a religious meeting, right? These maps are pedagogical and what pedagogy implies, right? What it contemplates is that it's a purposeful message, right? We, the learner, may not be told that there is an aim. It's an outcome. That is the measure by which we figure out whether the education is successful or not, right? This is why they call it like the hidden curriculum, right? But it's there and it's on purpose. So we're not putting this in the center because we're just centering ourselves and we love ourselves. Um, and I'm pointing at me as a representative of America, not as emblematic of the people who are ourselves, right? But we're putting it there so that our entire nation of children, so that the entire nation of people understand that we are at the center, right? And I, I love a sort of thinking about the map um, because we also have this language comes to us from economics, right? The traditional economic wisdom tells us rules about supply and demand, right? The traditional economic wisdom tells us that, you know what? If you want a better job, if you want a living wage, just everyone demand it. And if you demand it, this is how it will work. And, right, like, and these natural forces happen. And if you don't have it, you lack merit right? And these rules, these basic rules of economics in like the MMT context, right? We are taught, right, to compare households and the government. We're taught that they're the same and that they should have the same values. We're separately taught, in America at least, that you're supposed to be independent and you're supposed to work hard because if you want to eat, you need to work hard. And if you want health care, get a job. And if you want to do all these things, you got to work for it because freedom isn't free and food isn't free and housing isn't free, right? We're taught that for our individual lives and we're taught that the government is the same. And so then, right, when a political moment happens and people are like, hey, maybe everybody should have a job and that job that everyone has should be at a living wage. And maybe everyone should have housing, regardless of how and whether and what work they do, right? And maybe everybody should have access to health care, because if we have something called a right to life, maybe you need health care for that, right? And we are trained, right? Even myself, I'm not going to lie, right? I have to actively dissuade my instinctual now, instinctual thought, how do I pay for it? It's not ingrained in me born. Come here, Amantha. Come here. This kid uh -huh. right here, I'm going to show you this kid, but she's slow. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Oh. Now, this, is, this, is a, this is a not accurate <laughs> scholarship, right? I also don't sit around talking with this kid about the finer points of economic thinking, right? But this kid right here has asked the questions, wait, mom, why don't we just give everyone a house? Why are there homeless people? He said, oh, well, the, them's the breaks. Not everybody has money. Well, why don't we just give people money? Mm -hmm. She said, well, I, well, of course I responded, well, that's not how money is distributed. And she was like, well, who, who, who makes the money? It's like the government makes the money. She says, so why doesn't the government give all the homeless people money <laughs> for houses, right? So this isn't, when I say I instinctively have to dissuade myself, this isn't ingrained born natural instincts, which is another fallacy, right? Because this current first grader who said this when she was in preschool, mm. right? Was able to say, that doesn't make any sense. The yes. pay for question is stupid. So our natural understanding of the world makes it clear that like we can just give people in some sense the things that are necessary. Like I said, she was, how old are you, six? She was three or four. So, right, she's not doing sophisticated economic analysis. But the natural conclusions are there. And what we do when we send her to school Right, and what we do when we turn on the television, and what we do when we teach her about money, is dissuade her of these very fundamental ideas, which are it is at least 
possible for everyone to have a house. It is possible for everyone to have employment. And if we choose to use money as a distributor of resources, it is possible to ensure that the minimum necessary resources come and are available to everyone, right? And if a three, four, five, six, seven, eight year old can get that, before they've been brainwashed and colonized by these false messages, we should be able to deprogram adults. Right. Well put. <laughs> Love it. Um, I'm going to uh, switch it up a, a, a little bit. Um, and um, uh, I uh, had my first college class 1983 temple university uh department of pan-african studies a course introduction to the black aesthetic taught by uh poet sonia sanchez and it it, it was a life-changing experience uh for me uh the professor is such a powerful communicator and uh the the main uh, theme, in a sense, of the course was that in the history of the African-American freedom struggle, politics and culture are inseparable. And if we think about the role of music and, and, and arts, and then the political and uh, struggle for social justice, um, that's very different than the way that art is viewed traditionally in the, the West or, or it, you know, coming out of the European, Euro-American tradition because art kind of gets depoliticized in the museums. And I, I was wondering if you might speak a little bit about the role of politics and culture. You know, I think it's, so there's a couple of critical uh, pedagogues out there. One is named Henry Giraud, um, mm. and another is named Peter McLaren. Um, and they've got issues, uh, largely they've got issues on, you know, in my view, race and gender. So they like to white man all over the place, but uh, they do good white manning because the things that they're saying are right. Uh, they need to cede some space to other voices. That being said, I love them and I love their work. Um, and they've spent a lot of time, you know, I'm harping on this pedagogy thing, looking at the educative function of culture and art in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and they have really great literature that talks about this depolitization of music and yeah. art in the West and how once again, it's not an accident, it's on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, you know, paradigmatic anti-neoliberalists. Mm -hmm. um, so right, they, they assign this function, right, to our obsession right? Our obsession with the market, right? Mm -hmm. We got to sell things and selling and market principles and market instincts are the central, the core. It's a way to assign and assign value and to identify all good. And if you create a cultural cult around the market, what you're gonna see, right? Rap music is a really great example of, or hip hop, I should say more broadly, not just rap yeah. music. Hip hop as a movement, as a cultural space, which had elements, right? There's b-boying, there's DJing, there's graffiti, right? All of these things are, like, emerge as cultural resistance, sites of cultural resistance and educative projects, right? Graffiti is not just expression. Graffiti, right, the, the role of it is to publicly teach us about the conditions in an area, right? Mm -hmm. The the hip-hop graffiti, maybe not, yeah. you know, gang graffiti. We can have a different conversation about that, right? 
originally the, the conversations in rap music, right, are again, both resistance expression, but also educative expression, mm. teaching us about the conditions of uh, black people in the, the inner city, right? Mm. We can see that, right? That's the same project that um, uh, slaves in the, the old Negro spirituals, right? Right, that is the same project, right? They were stripped of their language, Yes. And had to reteach the values through the music, but also engage in political resistance. Not always widespread, we're burning down the plantation political resistance, but the political resistance of, you know, keeping their humanity. If you go to Hawaii, it's the same thing. So, mm -hmm. like, you go to Hawaii and you go to, like, the, the, the hula dance thing. And it turns out when the United States stole Hawaii from Hawaiians, they again outlawed the language of those people, right? And, you know, the music and the dance, which was, you know, a spectacle for... Uh, white colonizers from the United States um, also served a politically resisting fu function because th that's why it's so much storytelling. They actually used to sing in their language and tell stories, um, but when that was outlawed, they had to make the movements tell the stories, again, to retain humanity because they weren't kicking out Americans. So right. this is tightly tied together, mm. but when we you know, think post enlightenment European values that get grafted on to cultural performance around the world, you very frequently get this divorce. Though we can go to Europe and we see the same thing, right? This is why you have Irish dancers, right? This is why you have, uh, there's a really great project in Edinburgh, not in, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow right now of public, publicly resisting art again mm. right so this is not it, it's it's around sort of like a an education project that happened to come out of europe but the natural connection between cultural performance between politics between art music and politics is there um and has been there um and i'm not an art historian but i imagine an art historian could go yeah. on and on <laughs> no i think that really ties together with some of the other things that we've been talking about, the interdisciplinary um, and breaking down the walls between, just the walls that divide us in, in, in any way. And uh, I'm thinking back, we had the chance to have uh, Andres Bernal uh, last summer uh, for, uh, two months uh, he was in residence in in the department and so you know we got to talking quite a bit and he was sharing about Alexander Ocasio-Cortez's experience at Standing Rock so apparently she had sort of an epiphany when she was there that was at once political, moral, and spiritual. And traditionally on the left, talking about spirituality or religion is sort of poo-pooed. Uh, and when I see the young people, the Sunrise Movement, that are working so hard, and the, the uh, young people who are out there uh, in the struggle, and the, the daily struggle, it can get, at times, exhausting. It can get, at times, discouraging. I, watching the news can really just make you want to crawl up in a ball. And in the history of the African-American freedom struggle, 
the role of spirituality in providing the the energy and the stamina to continue on it seems to me that uh in addition to you know the the institutional stability of the black church in the community uh, those kinds of issues that there is something more that uh, inner transformation is part of the total struggle is it not and i think we we got we can even take it further okay right? um and so you know uh on on my macro and cheese podcast right i said white people have to put stuff on the line but we talked about right like and you brought up like, how do we create unity um and so the spiritual element in an individual way has all of these great functions right it mm. creates space it creates resilience or it, it helps foster resilience mm. but it's also a real project for centering marginalized communities now mm. i can't speak to every uh community of color right but you already said it civil rights movement had a center within the black church right and not necessarily the capital black church of you know christ is really important but a lowercase black church mm -hmm. of an institutional space of solidarity with a spiritual foundation right mm -hmm. we talk about standing rock right i don't presume to be able to adequately or accurately reflect the varying native cultures but i can say that when you go in those spaces, they are deeply spiritual, yes. right? You want to get Latinx communities in a, as a part of your movement? This is why those liberation theology, right? In Latin America, revolution is run by Catholic priests, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. we can have long conversations about the particular religions and the particular institutional problems. Mm -hmm. But how do revolutions get run by clergy? Real revolutions get run by clergy? Well, they get run by clergy because the people have deeply committed spiritual orientations. Mm -hmm. I go to this annual Black Women Law Professors Conference, mm -hmm. and I remember the first time I went, I was floored because we're all and you know we're black women professors which means we have the most elite possible credentials because if we didn't we couldn't get jobs anywhere so there are all these people from the ivy leagues who have all of these elite credentials who are really good at mm. traditional science and mm. traditional economic thinking and they want to open up with prayers and they're telling stories about how what they did at church and i'm like and everybody's just openly religioning all over the place <laughs> right um and that's not okay and so if you really want to bring in broadly communities that's not to say that there's not you know people of color who don't and are not interested in religious religious um engagement or spiritual activation let's say right. that spiritual activation right. but when you act like spirituality is irrelevant when you act like spirituality is anti-progressive when you act like spirituality is anti-intellectual what you tell masses of people who have used their spiritual space just like you described matt which is to survive to right. claim their humanity to thrive or at least look towards thriving given the depressed conditions in which they find themselves when you tell them that it's off the table then i'm not a part of your fight and i don't want to be a part of your fight and you reassert that it's us versus them because yes. this atheism stuff this we don't have any spirituality this you're dumb if you're spiritual is culturally coded as both white yes. and male which excludes even the like non-spiritual person of color because right. it's so culturally raced it's so gendered um that you might not want to participate you might not be able to get on fire about it mm. 
thank you. Well, 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 uh, might I say amen? I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I think, you know, we've so uh, many examples, you know, um, obviously Cornell West, uh, you, you know, uh, go on and on, but you say it, it, it includes because, you know, it's a very personal thing, but the solidarity that can be created just, um, you know, I mentioned uh, Sonia Sanchez um, and beginning of the semester, end of the semester, everyone would get in a circle uh, holding hands and they would go around and have an opportunity to just say thank you or, you know, whatever it is. But it's such a simple thing and yet so powerful to, and pretty much I was always the only white person and sometimes even the only man in a lot of my black studies classes. Uh, so, you know, I appreciated and was so humbled by how I was uh, treated. And, um, you know, I always tried to take my education back to white people and men and so I could convey to them and it, it, it really is, I have so much appreciation uh, for my teachers. I mean, it's just incredible and I'm also, you know, often humbled by the appreciation that's expressed to me by my students. And um, so uh, I think uh, maybe we should open it up for some questions from the listeners. Is that okay Not with you, me. Lua? Okay. What do you think, Andy? Well, I'd like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. I, 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 I love uh, the interaction between the two of you. That was great. All right. So if anybody has any questions, please indicate us to us that, uh, that you have one and we'll unmute you. Or comments or... And um, while we're waiting for that, uh, Professor Yule, if you have any, you know, any additional um, uh, thoughts you wanted to share, because I sort of was asking you all questions, but it, it maybe is some some topics that I I didn't cover that you'd like to uh, touch on as well. No, though I think it's important, you know, to be clear, right? Like I I think I liked spiritual engagement where I landed. Right, because let's not be confused. There's been a lot of harm done by religion or religious institutions, specific religious institutions. Um, and I don't think that that's the conversation we're having. Right? Absolutely. The fact that a lot of people's spirituality is pegged to those institutions suggests sort of a balance that has to be looked for. Um, but it's not to say, right, like, I brought up Catholicism. It is not to say, let's not think about the particular institutional infirmities. It's saying, look at the power of that as a motivator in communities. Um, when we're in the, 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 the process of thinking about um, organization and the process of thinking about how we come um, together. Let me share something really quick with you on that because it, it's just, 
incredible to me. I had a student, a female student from China, and uh, she uh, uh, had brought into her dissertation proposal uh, some of the principles of Taoism and Buddhism. And uh, I had not one, but two colleagues on the committee from the economics department, people who everyone listening right now know of, who basically said, uh, I can't be on this committee. And one unbelievably uh, wrote in the comment, organized religion is the cause of all the world's problems. Uh, I mean, you know, like, I do not understand that. But the thing is that we've had many students who say draw on a critical realism or another, you know, philosophy to um, build up their methodology. And there was no difference between that and the work that this uh, young woman was doing. And uh, yeah, it just showed so much ignorance, prejudice, uh, Eurocentrism, racism, and so on that, I, you know. Anyway, I'm happy to say that um, we replaced uh, them on the committee with uh, two of my <laughs> other colleagues, and both of the new colleagues gave them, uh, gave the, the young woman uh, honors in, you know, her, uh, yeah. Wow. Not any, you know, thing from me. Okay, Jabari, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I love this talk that you have because I have this talk all the time where other people, including my own fiance, that don't understand how um, pervasive this whole Calvinistic attitude of, we have to work hard in order to get things, not understanding that working hard isn't how people have succeeded. It's mo most people have succeeded but because of how they look or who they know. And that at the end of the day, in a country, you know, forget the country, a world like this here, where we have the resources to take care of people, why are we not doing it? Anybody got an answer for that? <laughs> yes. Racism, sexism, <laughs> misogyny, classism, and like honestly, there's no other answer. And we've got to get comfortable saying, you right? Like, I call it the cult of scarcity, by the way. And I think racism, classism, misogyny are just <laughs> ways of perpetuating the cult of scarcity. This is why, and again, I have lived part of my life as a person who was super into fashion, right? Super American, that your, like your expression through your clothes matters. When I was trained as a child, and I still, I'm not gonna lie, I have this conversation with my nephews. Why do you wanna look like everybody else, right? I used to like those Croc shoes because they were really uncomfortable, or because they were really comfortable, excuse me. And then everybody got Crocs. And when everybody got Crocs, I was like, peace out. They weren't cute in the first place. Why? Because its value came from me having these special shoes from abroad, right? <laughs> we do that and we extend it down to the very things that we need to live. And in order to make sure that I got something that you don't have, we've got to make black people at a different place on a hierarchy because at the end of the day, we've got these intersecting things, right? So class is there. Not all white people can be rich because scarcity doesn't work if all the white people are rich. So we got to have some of the white people be poor, but they're poor because of class, right? And they're cut poor because of this. And the black people also have to have these categories. It's all about this cult of scarcity. If we don't say it. Absolutely. I think Roseanne Bravo. has a question. Roseanne, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I can't tell you how much, because I'm a little bit older than Matt, and I think a lot older than <laughs> Professor uh, Yule. Professor Ewell here, you are absolutely what teachers, educators, 
need to be. One of the best teachers I ever heard did not want to teach people. And he was Mr. Aristocratic. Oh, talk to students? Oh, no, you don't do that. And why do we do this? What is teaching and learning about? Your children have to go out there, Lua, and show them. <laughs> and show them. Anytime I wanted to show people in the 50s, I was the goofy one. Okay. Something was wrong with me. I was the kid who talked funny, who didn't have the right kind of clothes, all that kind of crap. Okay. Why? Because I was listening to that garbage. But old person that I am, Grumbine turned the light on for me. And then I meet all these great people at the MMT. Oh, my God. You got to do it. I'll keep telling her. You know I'll stop anybody who stops long enough to listen. We got to tell them, Lua, honey, get those kids out there. Get them. Send them over to me. I need them in Nevada. <laughs> we got to do this. We got to do this. Every, every burner person who comes here to my house gets a little MMT lesson. Mm. And I give, them, I give them all your videos. And, and muffins. Your, yeah, and muffins. And muffins. Please, go ahead. I just, we got to <laughs> share, share, share. That's what we have to do. That's it. That's it. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. That's awesome. Do we have any other questions? I think Roxanne. Oh, can, can you unmute uh, Roxanne, please, Rosie? Oh, I don't think, I don't think Rebecca can, um, she just said she's on the radius road, so I don't think she can uh, talk. Did she write a question in? No, she was she was responding to the to the conversation about spirituality, and and as a Christian, she was saying that she's basically stopped saying that she's a Christian because people because it means something where it's not the Christianity that, what does she say? Um, oh God, I just lost it. Uh, not, she, she just, it's why I don't call myself a Christian anymore. Not for lack of faith, but because the orthodoxy does not represent the Jesus I know, the one who overturned the money changers tables and healed on the Sabbath. Well, and I mean, we live in a, we live in a, 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 a culturally, Christian country where Christianity dominates. Um, and I totally appreciate the uh, diffidence um, that some Christians have um, around talking about Christianity, given um, it, how it's been co-opted by, you know, um, oppressive movements, like separate from the history of organized religion, right? How it's been uh, co-opted today, right? In the law, Christianity is being used as the shield. I get to discriminate. I get to hurt because I'm a Christian. So mm. I get that. But at the same time, right? Just as much as we need young folks, like real young folks, not like me, but like actual young folks <laughs> to be at the forefront of possibilities because their brains have a level of plasticity that mine don't or ours don't right we also need christians in this space to say not my jesus not my christianity right and you know people are super happy to demand of muslims that they say not my muhammad 
right? Not my Islam. But we need Christians to say, not my Christianity, because this is the project. It's a project of a universal and a radical love. That's what mm -hmm. I'm not Christian, but that's what Christianity is about, right? Mm -hmm. And we need Christians to say that so that when people like me say stuff like Christianity is a radical project, Jesus was a radical, right? I've got backup. And so we got to find that space so that Christians who find Christianity as the center of their identity can come and come back to the radical movement that they're a part of. In the same way, every religious tradition was a radical movement, right? And it was a radical movement for liberation, each in their time. And getting folks to be back in that conversation and understand that liberation means that we got to have the means to survive, right? And this is, you know, taking us back to economics, right? That's what we're doing. We're reproducing society. We're provisioning the needs to reproduce society, right? And religion's job, at least in the physical world, is to help us do that in a healthy way, right? In a way that gets everybody their needs met. And having that discourse um, around faith and spirituality um, is so hard to do because most the loudest voices on Christianity are telling me that the role of Christianity is to ensure that some people don't use uh, somebody else's bathroom. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm really positive that that's not what Jesus was about. Like, I don't like, but I'm not a Christian. So I don't have any authority in that space. Uh, if I could just add in like, so in order you know to be as inclusive as possible uh, even you know uh, atheists i have been sort of repeating this line that um uh, about um can we unify around the idea of commitment to a life affirming principle that all life is dignified and respect worthy and then that has ethical implications so it is not okay to talk to others in an insulting and degrading manner, especially if one is president of the United States. Yet, what kind of a model is uh, our current president or young people? It seems like it's opened up, it's okay to be rude. It's okay to be racist and sexist it, we have to unify stand up and say no it is not it is not okay and he does not represent all whites he does not represent all men he does not represent all christians in any way shape or form that's perfect thanks matt okay listen I think Virginia has a question. Virginia? Um, yeah, before we release uh, Professor Yule to her children, I would like you to talk a little bit about how we should be thinking about intersectionality versus class and internationalism and identity politics. I find there's so much confusion about these issues. It's like Bernie being criticized of only focusing on class. It, well, I think, I, I think you know what I'm asking. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on finding a balance. So I guess the number one thing for me, or I guess uh, the, 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 the goals for me, from my perspective, um, I spend a lot of time, I, I tell people I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in actual reality, right? So uh, we use jargon um, to signify that we know things. 
Um, and very frequently that jargon is not used right, right? And so there's this uh, bad word of identity politics, but all identity politics is really, and the phrase was coined to reflect, right? That our political engagement reflects and is motivated by a different identity positions, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding that, is, duh, it's not, a, it's not like a, a revolutionary idea. It's really laying bare what was always true, right? In the you know, identity politics as a term, it, it really comes from black feminism. And they're saying, this is why law, this is why law benefits white men, because white men are making the law. And so our politics has to be informed by our identity positions, right? Intersectionality does no work. It's not a useful, uh, it, it, it's not a movement, right? What it is, is a way of describing reality that suggests, and you know, there's multiple marginality, there's lots of ways, but the, you know, the one that captured the attention of folks is to talk about, uh, is to use the term intersectionality. It does no work. All it does is say, right, that our different identity positions are not, at, like, they're not aggregative. They're not siloed. They work together so that they're alchemy, right? And so my experience as a Black woman is not, and I just chose two of my many identities, right? But my experience as a Black woman isn't Black man plus white lady equals me. Right? My experience as a black female religious minority from a black middle class, right? Because there's no such thing as a middle class. I'm from a black middle class, which means my family has less wealth than a white middle class family, right? But these things combine in ways that don't that don't equal the sum of the generally central uh, or centralized or centered position. That's all it does. It's just a descriptor. And so how do we balance these things? We actually engage what I think the, the background critique is, right? And so if the critique, let's say, of a Bernie Sanders is that you're insufficiently talking about other vectors of identity, one, we engage with other vectors of identity, but we also complicate our class analysis. Like I just said, there's no such thing as a middle class that's black and white and Latinx and Asian. They mean different things by mere virtue of my blackness having different wealth implications and being in the middle for black is actually lower than white. What it meant for me to, right? But in other ways, frankly, there's a lot of performative class things that a middle class white person does that I do very differently. Right, so I'm a middle class black person, but I was flying all over the country when I was a kid in the early 80s, uh, not the early 80s, in the early 90s and in the 80s, right? And that was not the standard of America at that time. So it's complicated. And, you know, again, in terms of organ organizing, what we need to do is engage that complication and recognize. And so like, you know, I don't, I don't advise Bernie Sanders, but if I did advise Bernie Sanders, when I was asked, to engage more fully with different vectors of identity. Mm -hmm. If class is my center, and frankly it is, it's not a critique of, of Sanders to suggest that his real concern you know, prioritizes class, it would be to say, well, but this class analysis has this racialized implication and has this uh, gendered implication and has this implication for LGBTQIA communities and has this religious implication because I know things, those things matter to everyone. Um, and I think that that's hard um, because it gets us out of our wheelhouse. And frankly, uh, uh, you know, there's a reason that Marx focused on class, right? It's compelling and focusing on one thing is easy. It's the, there's a reason that race crits focus on race, right? It's compelling and you can tell a, a neat story. But if we're coalition building, we've got to recognize people's uh, interests. Um, don't become offensive, uh, defensive about it. Um, and I think that that's true for all of us who are on the ground out there stumping for people, right? So when I look on Twitter, I'm on Twitter all the time and people critique Sanders um, on race. What I see back is, 
no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. Instead of, this is how the positions that I see from Sanders would apply or be relevant in a racialized context. And I'm sure that Bernie understands that, right? If you, I mean, I'm not out there doing these things, but I, the people who are making these critiques are gonna be probably a lot more receptive if that's the response. And then they're probably gonna push back with, well, I wish Bernie would say that, in which case, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> exactly, like, right, okay. <laughs> Thank you the so much. You. The unfortunate thing about using Bernie Sanders as an example there is that uh, there's currently a push in mainstream media to try to vilify him in any possible way. So it's sure. not really a good time to bring him up as an example. Well, yeah, and right, like so a lot of critiques are not good faith critiques. And like that's a that's a that's an aside, right? Like, well, that's not actually an aside. That's important too, because we need to be thoughtful enough and understand the terms of the game enough to see when it's good faith and when it's not good faith. And if it's not good faith, the, uh, the appropriate response, just like you do to a troll, is to not respond. Mm. Um, and I, I, I think that that comes with developing your own facility, right? With some of this stuff. So yes, I agree, right? Like uh, there was a, a critique of uh, Bernie Sanders being anti-Semitic. And you're just like, <laughs> and I, I'm not the person, in fact, I tweeted about this. I was not the person who said he's not an anti-Semite because he's Jewish, right? It's like, he's not an anti-Semite because he's not an anti-Semite. And like, right, like we haven't seen actions that suggest anti-Semitism. There are Jewish people who are out there promoting anti-Semitism. There are agents of anti-Semitism all over the place. It just doesn't happen to be Bernie Sanders. So there's a point at which it devolves into idiocy. Um, and you can see that in, you know, in f f not just for Bernie Sanders, across um, a lot of political candidates. I can't necessarily say um, that there's, you know, we, that, the current occupant of the White House is a more complicated case in terms of uh, good faith versus bad faith critiques <laughs> because there's a lot of space for bad faith critiques to still be right. Um, but um, I, I, I think that that's absolutely an important thing to think about. You know, hashtag don't feed the trolls uh, is both annoying, um, but also sometimes really, really true. Um, and it's hard when you're passionate about, you know, it's really hard when you're passionate about the particular candidate. Um, and I think it gets exacerbated in the case of Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders is the, as, close as, as close to a revolutionary that we've got in American politics. And so if you're really committed to the revolution, in particular, the revolution that he could auger, let's not say that I, I don't think Bernie Sanders is a revolutionary. I don't think he's that radical, but the revolution that could be augured uh, by Bernie Sanders, it's that much harder um, not to get into uh, the, the, the lack of good faith fray. Excellent. Very good. Okay. So does anyone have any further questions? And I, does anybody see I, uh, <clears throat> Andy? Yes, sir. Uh, I think um, I just want to let people know that uh, if um, they have questions, you know, later on, I mean, it's, um, it's, it, please, uh, you can always, um, you know, uh, multiple ways of contacting us. So uh, please don't hesitate. Yeah, absolutely. If, they, if there's something that you think of later that you want to ask of our guests, um, any, any one of us at uh, Real Progressives uh, would be able to reach out and make sure that they get that question in. And uh, I know that Matt likes to uh, get back to people very quickly. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't respond quickly, just reach out again, it tends to mean I responded in my brain. Um, and my brain <laughs> did not communicate it with my fingers uh, to the appropriate device. Okay, Believe me, it? there's uh, uh, 134 people out there that when Andy said that are saying, he's gotta be joking. <laughs> <laughs> I was and, just trying to be kind. Us, <laughs> and those of us who know him know that he was indeed. <laughs> 
Uh, am I that readable? Am I an open book? I didn't realize that. Oh. All right. So um, I see I a guess... comment open. Do we have Gregory Gregory. Has a comment? Um, hi, I'm Gregory Mallard. Um, I'd like to also add something about all of this. Um, we, what we need to do to pretty much bridge the divides in our country is to have progressive legislation to pretty much come forth that would work for everyone that would work for everyone amongst all income classes, bridge that divide instead of having it be so fractured and broken like our society is today. And something else that I would like to see is the federal job guarantee, which would seriously, and I mean seriously bridge the divides because when you guarantee these people who, who really want the work, who are out of work, the federal job guarantee would come in and bridge the divides to pretty much curb the poverty we have today. And it would pretty much bring all classes of people together, whether it's race, religion, what have you. It would um, pretty much unite the country to pretty much end poverty as we know it. And that's why I support the federal job guarantee. And if there's a candidate who's running for office and they do, and they do not have the federal job guarantee on their platform, I'm not wasting my time supporting them, and I am not wasting my time even voting for them. That's where I cross a line. You've got to support the federal job guarantee, which is going to pretty much solve every single issue that we're faced with, along with the Green New Deal, along with Medicare for All, possibly a national health service, tuition free education and so forth. That's the only way we as a society will come together and pretty much be totally bridged. Thanks, Gregory. Cool. Gregory, can I can I say one quick thing? Yes. I love everything that you've said, but I want I want to be a a, a, a I want to rain on the parade, which is the most important thing that you said was as you as we know it. Right? I think that everybody who's in the fight However you are in the fight needs to understand that even if you win tomorrow, the fight will not be done, right? right? All of our problems, class, race, gender, as problems, as dividers of society, and I've said this many times, are technological. They evolve. And so when we get a federal jobs guarantee to end poverty, as we know it, we will have other forms that we need to continue to combat. And so I just think it's really important for all of us to know that this is a fight for eternity. And if you are a true warrior of justice, if you truly believe in justice, you need to understand that it's you and it's them and it's their kids. And as long as we have an earth, if we save it, it will continue to be the ongoing obligation to have calls like this, trying to figure out what we're supposed to be doing because it's not an endpoint. Ending oppression, ending poverty, ending racism is not an endpoint. It is an ongoing vocation of humanity. That's very true. And um, Jeremy Corbyn, the, UK, the, the outgoing UK Labour Party leader says, Think of the next generation because that's what true leaders are supposed to do. And I'm looking at your children. That's the reason why I'm in this fight. It's not because of me. It's not because of our generation. I'm a millennial. I'm not in this for my generation. I'm in it for the next generation because I'm fearful of what they're going to have to go through next. Thanks. I live in fear for what the next generation is gonna to have to go through. And that's why I am so passionate about MMT and every core component of the Green New Deal that will continue to evolve, like you said, and will thrive for generations to come. We've got to teach the next generation everything we know and pass it down to them in order for them to pass it down to their children and their children pass it down to their children. We've got to keep this revolution going strong for generations to come. It doesn't end with us. It's going to have to continue going. 
and it's going to have to be up to us to teach the next generation the right things. Right. Thanks, Gregory. Thank you very much, buddy. Um, uh, okay, I would say that um, we are now at the point where if there are no, don't see any nope. more questions. Okay. Yes. So I think that, uh, uh, thank you so much to, uh, Matthew and Lua. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I don't think I'm just speaking for myself. I think that very, very thankful that you guys were able to join us tonight. And, uh, uh I, I look forward to further conversations and I'm going to probably be writing questions all night that I'm going to send to Lua that she'll never answer, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, <laughs> so I feel thank so you again. Seen. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you. So um, if, uh, if you want, if you want to stick around, please do. If not, if you have to go again, thanks. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Steve Grumbine. Man, uh, thank you guys so much. This was really, really, really insightful. As usual, I really enjoyed. Uh, we have some great guests come through here. This is like just an absolute ton of riches that we just get. It's, it's almost obscene how much wonderful knowledge gets uh, brought to these calls. And Lua and Matt, thank you both so much for. Um, I mean, you, re you didn't mail it and you really put it on the line. You did great. And I, I, I thank you for that. It means a lot to me. Um, with that said, um, you know, for those of you all who know everything that goes on here, what I'm about to say will probably be a bit of a repeat. But for those of you who are new or maybe haven't been engaged in a while, um, Real Progressives is now a 501c3. And Real Progress in Action is now a 501c4. And as a result, we now are, you know, we, we shed the title of being a Facebook group. And we can start getting to the business of making change happen. And we were already doing that before. And we've got made some really great inroads. Uh, a lot of people over the years have been impacted by our work and by the guests that we brought in. I'd like to see that continue to grow. With that said, um, we just recently uh, picked up a new um, studio setup for all of our live streams and video recordings and stuff called Live Studio 6. And this is an incredible switcher studio that will basically turn us in, into like a full-blown news outlet. I mean, we, we are going to be able to do things that you've never seen before unless you're watching the mainstream television. The difference will be that it will be through an MMT lens and it will be highly intersectional. And uh, you're going to start seeing some real significant changes here. Uh, one thing that came out of this conversation tonight and Lewis previous um, interview with me is that, you know, it's like until white people start putting it on the line and really you know, falling on the sword, it, it, things aren't going to change. And until real progressives take our mission as seriously as Lua put it out there, this, this, this needs to, we need to see this as a, a true calling, as an opportunity to be in the position to fall on that sword, not as a passing hobby. I really see us as the tip of the spear and have an opportunity to make substantive change by being inclusive and, and really putting all of ourselves into uh, this fight with all, with everything we've got. And, and so as we go forward, I'm hoping um, that we've got some initiatives. One of them is to bring in Microsoft Office Group. I, I don't know what that is, but if somebody can use that one line for me, it would be really helpful. Um, but it, the hope is that we will be able to leverage these office tools so that we can get organized. The enemy that we fight out there is not just a belief system or anything else like that. It is an actual um, well-oiled machine, a very, very uh, – come on up here, Butterfish. My son, come here. Um, 
the idea here is is that we are fighting a very very organized entrenched enemy, and it, it takes an organization like ours to be able to fight back. So I hope each of you find ways to contribute and uh, be involved. And I'm sorry, my son has <laughs> he's just broken into the party. Yes, buddy. Okay, let's go in the room. I'll be right out there. Let's go. Let's go. So with that, my son is going to cut me off short here, and I'm going to just say thank you guys very much for joining tonight, and I look forward to seeing you on the flip side. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much, Steve, and all of you for all the great work you do. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm just going to quickly take over for Steve here for just a, a, a couple of minutes. Um, we're always um, uh, uh, looking for for new people, new people um, to help us uh, volunteer at uh, Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action. Um, we're constantly looking for people with uh, different skill sets. Um, as far as writing or uh, video editing or uh, audio editing or uh, you know, uh, HR or any type of, of, of skill set that we could use in the business, um, we are absolutely uh, love to have people come out and, uh, and volunteer for us. It's a great organization to be a part of. Uh, we have all kinds of... Uh, of different people from different parts of of the world we have most of our volunteers are from the u.s of course i myself am from canada and we have a number of different people from australia so it's it's an international organization as well and uh, we'd love to have you if you're thinking about volunteering for a great progressive group this is one to do it would anybody else like to say anything um, I would like to say it was just a great call. Um, their conversation went into great depth on a lot of the issues that we're dealing with as a country, a world, and to be honest, even as a spiritual body. So we always have to remember that everything we do, we do it in love. And that's the only reason. Well, if there's no other comments or, or questions from anyone, um, I guess we could possibly uh, end the call a little bit early. Um, thank you, everyone, very much for coming out. Uh, that was absolute wonderful presentation. I hope that you uh, uh, got as much out of it as I did. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. And I, I can't, you know, just think of, of how unbelievable um Lua is and her perspective and and just her her uh, ability to uh to teach and and uh to uh convey her her uh, thoughts and ideas and it's uh you expect that you probably hear from her quite a bit through her her career um i'm i'm really looking forward to to like i said before to uh um further conversations in that regard uh so thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, I guess we'll all talk to you very soon. Thank, Thank you, Andy. Andy. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Well, uh, the real you came out tonight, okay? <laughs> the real you. The, the wonderfully um, sophisticated professor is who I heard on Macro and Cheese which inspired me to write a column. But tonight, this is you. This <laughs> is you. No, this is what you're supposed to do. We all have our place, right? We have our talent where we're supposed to make friends and influence people. And we influence them with our personalities, with the truth. Some people don't want to listen to the truth. That's their <laughs> fault. That's their fault. But you 
excite people. You have something that's, it's inspiring. It's magical. It's what teachers are supposed to be. We're all, each one teach one. We're all supposed to be teachers, but we can't do it like you can. Okay. <laughs> there are two kinds, two kinds. That's right. I have a question for Matthew. Yes. What temperature is it at your house right now? Uh, inside or outside? Outside. Outside, it must be around, what, 39 degrees? What is it, Lua? Uh, Lou and I in the same... Too cold. Yeah, I was like, at Matt's house, it's the same temperature as my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I don't. I know him better than you, so I, if I'm going to stay with somebody till April, it's going to be him. <laughs> yes, because please. It is. It's about minus ten here. Okay. Oh, so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's eighty degrees here in here. Florida. <laughs> also, yesterday, yesterday it was like fifty. Uh, so we had a really right. nice one yesterday. Is that good or Five bad? Five days ago, it was seventy three. Lua, oh, climate change. Lua, you know what, what we call 50 degrees in Canada? T-shirt weather. Summer. That, right? I was, summer. I was happy. I am from in Jabar, Jabari oh. State, it would be winter. <laughs> well, exactly. Like, my family is like, oh, it's hold on. Oh, <laughs> Jabari, it's sweater weather at 50. Yeah, trust me. <laughs> It's 50 degrees. I see everybody starting to put on their hoods and stuff. I'm be like, what? It's only 50. And I'm a neighbor. <laughs> I don't see everybody else's excuse. <laughs> <laughs>